In the last video, we talked about mise-en-scene and sound design in Spring in a Small Town, two of several elements that have led critics to call Fei Mu the poet-director. In this video, we'll talk more about what makes Spring in a Small Town poetic, focusing on its lyricism. We'll also talk about this film as allegory, about what it says not just about individuals, but also about the shared experiences of nations and even human beings in general. Lyricism is sometimes taken as a homonym for the word poetic. This is the quality of expressing subjective emotion, which in a work of art can take many different forms. A lyre is a musical instrument that is plucked or strummed, and from this root, a whole set of associations emerges. The lyrical is something set to music or embodying qualities of rhythm, pitch, timbre, resonance, and rhyme. One implication of these associations is that a lyrical work of art doesn't just narrate a linear set of events, but intensifies emotion, perhaps through repetition, perhaps through tone, or perhaps through imagery and symbolism. Other lyrical associations that we often find include the natural world, which follows its own rhythms, such as the seasons, the flow of water, the rising and setting of the sun. The lyricism of Feimu's Spring in a Small Town comes from several of these factors, especially the focus on emotional lives of the characters and the use of symbolic motifs. Chinese lyrical traditions emphasize the value of restraint, including the repression of emotion. When Yuan goes to visit Zhichun on the night of the birthday party, for example, she's in a particularly fluid state. She's intoxicated, amorous, and unrestrained. As she advances towards Zhichun's room, Fei Mu intersperses shots of the moon, the moon being a traditional trope symbolizing the mutual longing of lovers separated by space, but still conscious that the same moon shines upon them both. We also see the potted orchid that Yuan had earlier had sent to his room. The orchid symbolizes her regard for him. And it had also provoked the jealousy of Dai Xiu, who presented a competing token to Zhichen, a penjing, or bonsai, that she had made herself. In Spring in a Small Town, we see just five people. But the themes that we find in this small drama, for example, that return does not equal repair, resonate with the national trauma that China was still undergoing. China was a nation of refugees. People were returning home and trying to pick up the pieces of their lives. They were trying to find ways to cope with the losses caused by the anti-Japanese war, even as China was in civil war. Fei Mu's film captures an indeterminate moment in modern China's trajectory. It expresses no certainty that this broken nation can or will be repaired and made whole again. It expresses what could be called a poetics of hesitation, rather than a victory and reconstruction. For choosing contemplation over triumphalism, it was attacked by contemporary critics. As many later critics have observed, however, Fei Mu was drawing on a deeper poetics, one immortalized by the Tang Dynasty poet Du Fu in his celebrated poem, Spring Gazing. The poem goes like this. Nation shattered, mountains and rivers remain. City in springtime, grasses and trees grow thick. Moved by the times, flowers draw forth tears. Loath to part, birds startle the heart. Beacon fires, a light three months running, and a letter from home is worth a fortune. White hairs, fewer for the scratching, soon too few to hold up a hat pin. Du Fu's poem alludes to a rebellion that had forced the emperor to flee the capital and which marked the beginning of the decline of the Tang Dynasty. It draws a contrast between human suffering and the indifference of nature. Flowers and birds do not care at all for the concerns of empire. Human affairs have reached a nadir, yet the seasons continue to turn. Signs of renewal, the blooming of flowers, the calls of birds, bring the poet not joy, but sadness and anxiety. The poet's concern for his nation is symbolized by a final self-mocking image of decline. He's losing his hair. Again, in 1948, the Japanese had been defeated, but China was still amidst the chaos of civil war, and its future was uncertain. Besides the Du Fu poem, Spring in a Small Town also contains other classical tropes, a modernized version of the so-called talented scholar and beautiful woman, or Cai Zijiaren plot formula. 
Scholar beauty plots were popular in pre-modern drama and literature. Typically in these stories, a young man is a candidate for the civil service examinations, and on his way to the exams, he falls in love with a beautiful woman, perhaps a courtesan, or perhaps a woman of high birth. They fall in love, part from and pine for each other, but he eventually returns in triumph, having taken first place in the exams. Scholar and beauty marry and live happily ever after. In Fei Mu's film, Zhang Zhichen could be said to be a type of modern scholar. He's a medical doctor. And Zhou Yuan is certainly a beauty, so the premise fits. The scholar beauty narrative takes on an allegorical dimension in this film, however, since beauty already has a husband. Lian is not an ideal match. He's sickly, calling to mind a negative trope about China common in the late 19th century, the sick man of Asia. Nor is his illness purely physical. He suffers from melancholia and depression. His formerly rich family has declined, and under his watch, reached a nadir, for which he blames himself. China's trajectory for much of the late 19th and early 20th century, too, was decline. Yuan's choice thus could be interpreted as one between a modern, talented, perhaps westernized scholar, Jurchen, after all, always wears a suit, and the choice, on the other hand, of a traditional scion from a once well-off family whose days are numbered. Lian, who always wears a Chinese gown, seems to recognize the dilemma when he attempts to take his own life. So if Spring in a Small Town is a scholar beauty story of modern wartime, it does not follow the traditional comic trajectory, because not all ends well. The course of love does not run smooth, and scholar does not end up with beauty. An allegorical reading of the ending could yet result in a more optimistic, even patriotic interpretation of the film's ideology, one missed by its 1940s critics. Yuen chooses fidelity over passion, and chooses to honor the commitment she made to her husband. Her man might be laid low now, but she will stay with him for life. Like her ailing husband, this broken country might yet be fixed. While Fei Mu's film is pregnant with allegorical meaning and symbolism, it is not merely a commentary on the state of the nation, because it shows the personal costs of loss. In other words, it is not just a story about a collective, abstract unit, but also about individuals as thinking, feeling entities. We hear Yuan's voice, and we watch her cut her hand on the window, breaking through a barrier in an attempt to reach her would-be lover. The motifs of the crumbling city wall and the broken walls of the Dai household also symbolize the broken physical state of some of the characters, not least the injured Yuan and the sickly Li Yen. Spring in a small town begins with an arrival and ends with a departure. The sense of symmetry, however, is somewhat destabilized by all that has happened in between. We wonder, what will happen to these five people? Zhichen leaves town, presumably to continue his medical career. Dai Xiu has her future ahead of her, and may well end up going to a school that Zhichen recommends her for in a bigger city. Old Huang will no doubt continue to serve the Dai household until he retires. The future of Lian and Yuan is less certain. Lian's health may or may not improve, and this may depend on his relationship with Yuan. Yuan has already expressed her true feelings, her unextinguished passion for Zhichen, as well as her affection and her sense of duty towards Lian. In one of the final shots of the film, she stands next to Lian on the wall, where first she appeared alone, and she points ahead to the distance, possibly to their future together. Fei Mu died just three years after completing Spring in a Small Town, but his aesthetic of ruins has been influential, particularly during the last 20 years of Chinese cinema history. In 2002, filmmaker Tian Zhuangzhuang, a member of the so-called fifth generation of Chinese filmmakers who attended the Beijing Film Academy after the end of the Cultural Revolution, made a remake of Fei Mu's film. Tian had earlier directed a film called The Blue Kite in 1993, that showed the disastrous effects of Mao-era political movements on one family. The film was banned upon its release, and it prompted the authorities to prohibit Tian Zhuangzhuang from directing films for a whole decade. Springtime in a Small Town, as it's known in English, was Tian's comeback vehicle. The film sticks closely to the original story 
and recreates most of the scenes that appear in Fei Mu's version. But in contrast to Fei Mu, who used a range of camera distances and angles, and used dynamic editing with numerous dissolves, Tian's film includes many long takes and long shots with a constantly moving camera. The boat scene, for example, is done as one continuous take with the camera on the shore. Shots like these suggest continuity of time and space, while also imbuing the film as a whole with a voyeuristic quality. We lose some of the emotional intensity that comes from seeing the medium and close-ups of the characters' faces. Gone too is Yuan's voiceover, and with it, much of the feeling that this is her story. The combined effect is a greater distance from the characters, such that their struggles appear as more melodrama than drama. In my view, Tian Zhuang Zhuang made these artistic decisions because he wanted to convey his own sense of loss as a filmmaker by turning Fei Mu's film into something of an object of lament. Fei Mu's film represents a high point in the history of Chinese film artistry, and Tian Zhuang Zhuang uses multiple stylistic techniques to express his own feeling of distance from that bygone age. Tian Zhuang Zhuang's extreme long shots, which track behind objects to frustrate our desire for a clear, complete view of the characters, seems designed to make us also feel the distance and detachment from Fei Mu's era. If Fei Mu's film expresses melancholy over the personal and collective losses of the war, Tian's film expresses meta-melancholy over the loss of Fei Mu's poetics and the courage of a filmmaker to do something different. One other contemporary filmmaker who uses an aesthetics of ruins is Jia Zhangke, known for such films as Still Life from 2006, set in the ruins of a condemned city along the Yangtze River, 24 City from 2008, set in a condemned munitions factory in Chengdu that is slated to be torn down for a housing development, and I Wish I Knew from 2010, which has scenes set in a post-apocalyptic Shanghai. In each of these films, Jia Zhangke's mise-en-sen shows ruins upon ruins. He shows the places that people worked and lived in, in various states of demolition and decay. Some of these spaces are to be inundated by the reservoir created by the Three Gorges Dam. Others will vanish to be replaced by gleaming condominium apartment blocks. In Jia Zhangke's work, famous aesthetics of ruin reappear as a critique of and a lament for what has been lost in contemporary China and what have been the costs of China's rapid economic growth. Unlike Fei Mu, we are not dealing with wartime loss. Instead, we are dealing in part with loss created by prosperity, and Jia Zhangke mounts a salvage operation to preserve traces of the past and the dignity of its inhabitants. Since the early 2010s, the pace of demolition has been so rapid that people have started to refer to China as Chinar, meaning where to demolish next or what will be demolished next. Chinar has become a meme, born of an age of widespread forced evictions, and it indicates that unwanted destruction of homes and communities remains a proximate issue in China today, and that individuals and families around the country continue to struggle to cope with loss. Fei Mu's film also continues to resonate at a deeper level because it acknowledges that loss and grief are common to the human condition, and that a way forward though never easy, is at least possible.